Uh, yeah, so my name is Dimitris. I come from Edinburgh, and this is a collaborative work from uh, both Edinburgh and Athens. And uh, well, here what I'm going to present today is practically I'm going to give a, a metric which we call cryptocurrency egalitarianism. And what uh, we try to do is to evaluate various uh, cryptocurrencies or to actually provide a way to evaluate cryptocurrencies uh, with respect to what we refer to as crypto egalitarianism. And I will explain what you know, this means. And also by the end of the presentation, I will have shown you some, uh, how we have applied this metric to ex existing systems, both proof of work and proof of stake, and a comparison between the two. So to start things, uh, I'm gonna give a very brief introduction, uh, you know, a, a cover of uh, what, uh, what exists so far, because we've seen this, uh, these two days, uh, uh, these things being discussed a lot. So for every, in every cryptocurrency, a core part is the bro uh, block production election process. So how is the leader uh, elected in order to produce the block? So the two major uh, mechanisms are proof of work, where the participation is done via hardware and one, well, uh, well, the hashing power is what uh, decides who is gonna, who is eligible to, to produce the blocks. And the second is proof of stake, where the participation is done via the tokens themselves, uh, which are maintained by the system. And this is called uh, stake. So uh, a leader is uh, elected proportionally to how much stake they have in the system. So this was the state in cryptocurrencies and, uh, well, very early on, people actually wanted to start arguing for or against, or against cryptocurrencies. So they wanted to argue that some were more fair or more just compared to you know, their competitors. And especially when proof of stake uh, well, started uh, rising, it, uh, the whole discussion about the rich getting richer actually got more heated. So, well, the, the word egalitarianism started appearing in various uh, forums and uh, discussions. So in order to understand what, uh, what we, we think uh, crypto egalitarianism is, first let's see on what you know, uh, happens when the block is generated. And when a, for every leader that creates a block actually gets a reward. So the reward is, a, well, it, it has two purposes. It's, it's both a participation incentive and also, it's a way to distribute the newly created uh, coins to the system maintainers. So if we see block generators, uh, block generators as investors, uh, questions that come up is, how much uh, power does the block, uh, the block generator have in the system? And do we see big investors actually having more power, proportionally more power, to smaller investors? So if we were to distill this egalitarianism discussion into a question, the way we would do it is, uh, well, how does wealth accumulation affect how much power you have in a cryptocurrency system? And the argument that we make is that wealth, wealth well, rich investors should not be rewarded with disproportionate rewards. Okay, so up till now, the discussion was kind of ad hoc the uh, various parties made very you know, hand wavy arguments. So our motivation here was to actually give a concrete quantifiable metric in order to describe this, uh, well, this property that we want uh, cryptocurrencies to have and to actually have a single number in or, uh, to use in order to compare various coins. So what our crypto egalitarianism metric achieves to do is to give this, uh, this way to compare cryptocurrencies so that you know, a cryptocurrency that has smaller values of, of crypto egalitarianism is, well, worse in terms of this metric. And this, it means that the more money you have, the more uh, money you will get from the system proportionally. If you, if you, if you have larger values of this uh, metric, then this means that it is more fair. Uh, in the way that we describe it. So regardless of how much money you have, you will get the same proportional uh, from the system. So the first uh, step in uh, well, uh, finding this, uh, this metric, this single value, is to, de is to define what we call the egalitarian curve. So this curve actually shows us uh, the freshly generated return on investment that means the cryptocurrencies that an investor gets from the blocks production process 
and not, for example, from buying the coins themselves on exchanges, over the available well, investment that they have. And uh, we see this, uh, this curve for a fixed period, which we set to one year in our experiments, and we denominate everything in uh, US dollars in order to have you know, a way to compare things and, uh, and evaluate uh, the systems. So what we expect from the curve is that, uh, uh, well, the, well, before going to what we expect, let's see how we define this. So this is the, the function of the curve, and we see the, the, first, uh, the first part is the maximum expectation over all possible strategies. So if you have some specific amount of money, you can uh, choose which strategy to, to follow in order to allocate this money in equipment or electricity or to not do anything with it. So if we take the maximum over all possible strategies that you have, then we actually get the maximum returns that you can get with this specific amount of money. And this is actually the optimal strategy that you can follow. And then, uh, we also, uh, yeah, we also take, uh, I should also mention here that reinvesting capital is allowed in these strategies. So you can actually take the, the new, for example, Bitcoins that you created and, and turn them into dollars and buy more machines with them or use them to, to pay for electricity in order to gain more profits or to keep your machines running, for example. And so the ideal egalitarian curve uh, using this definition is actually the constant curve. And well, this might not be very intuitive at this point. So let's see the three cases. So if, you have, if we have a, an increasing curve, then that means that the more money you have, then the better your returns is. So this obviously is what I was describing before as you know, less egalitarianism. If you have a constant curve, then that means that regardless of how much money you have, then you will get the same exact uh, uh, percentage of uh, returns. So if, regardless if you have one dollar or hundred dollars or hundred million dollars, you will get, for example, ten percent back uh, as, a, as, an, as an investment. And this is the third case now. Can it actually be that the, the curve is uh, decreasing? So if it were decreasing, that would mean that if you have more money, you would actually get less uh, returns proportionally to if you were uh, well, if you had less money. So this well in euro terms, would mean that we could have some kind of mechanism for wealth redistribution from the wealthy to the poor, which is kind of good, unless you're wealthy. So let's see this mine experiment. So assume you have, for example, $100 as an initial investment, and you actually use, uh, you find the best strategy, the optimal strategy, and this strategy gives you back 10%. So in the end, you have $110. Okay, and let's see now, Assume you have $200. So there is a possible strategy, and this strategy says that you take these 200 and you split them into two, two pots of 100 each. And for each pot, you actually apply this, uh, the, this B1 strategy, the optimal strategy for the $100. So this you can always do, right? Because nobody prohibits you from splitting your money. And this is actually a strategy that will give you back $220, uh, obviously. So again, your... Uh, your returns is 10%. And what this says is that practically we cannot achieve anything better than that because the optimal strategy will always be at least as good as that strategy that I described now. So the, the curve cannot be decreasing. And this is actually a very uh, interesting uh, uh, and very interesting result, although kind of obvious when you think about it. Because this is also the reason why a decentralized blockchain government system cannot be anything but plutocratic. Because if one vote is one coin, then at all times, uh, the, the people that have more coins can split the, their coins and appear as you know, uh, poor. So you cannot do anything better than having one vote per coin. Okay, so since we have established our uh, egalitarian curve, we're now ready to actually define this, uh, this metric, this single number that I promised you at the beginning. And the way we describe it is, is pretty easy. So we take the variance of this curve and we put the minus uh, symbol in the front uh, and I explain why. So the variance means that, uh, well, if we have better egalitarianism, then we'll see the same ROI across all investments, right? 
But if we say you see the same records of, of our investments, which means if the, the curve is sta sta static, if it's stable, then we'll not see any variance at all, right? So it's, it will be zero. And this is the reason why we also introduced the minus uh, uh, symbol in the front, because we want zero to actually be the, the maximum. And the absolute number of the variance, uh, the absolute value of the variance, will be you know, uh, larger in, if we have an increasing uh, curve. Uh, so, okay, maybe, okay, yeah. Uh, uh, let's continue with the experimental results. So if we, now that we have the metric, let's try to apply it in existing uh, cryptocurrencies. So in our, experiment, uh, in our experiments, we had to make some assumptions. And uh, the first major assumption is that we assume a static environment. So in other ways, the cryptocurrency costs, the prices for cryptocurrencies, for equipment, for electricity, these all remain the same across this time span that they define this, this one year. Uh, additionally, we assume that the initial distribution of the hardware mining funds is the same. So we take a snapshot of the, of the, of the world at some point, and we assume that the money that you had at, some, at this point was, is the money that you can actually use in order to, to allocate to mining equipment and, uh, well, start mining and earning profit. And uh, also we assume that the system's parameters remain the same. So the difficulty, the block rewards, they don't change, and uh, we, we actually want them in order to, to make some meaningful comparisons over this, uh, this uh, time period. And finally, we also assume that mining itself does not affect uh, the environment, so this snapshot of the world that I described. And finally, another very important assumption is that we all, all only consider honest strategies. So for example, we don't, uh, we don't consider uh, a miner that actually performs selfish mining. And well, if he did, he could get uh, you know, some better profit. So in, the, in that way, uh, our experiments are kind of an approximation of the egalitarian curve that I described before. Uh, okay, so let's see what happens with proof of work first. So the proof of work cryptocurrencies that we looked into are oh, what we consider you know, the, the, the big ones. So it's uh, obviously Bitcoin which uh, uses the SHA-256 uh, hash function, and also Ethereum, which is you know, the second biggest proof of work cryptocurrency. Then we are interested also in Litecoin because Litecoin actually started uh, with uh, Script, and they actually made claims of egalitarianism because Script is more memory hard than uh, SHA-256. And uh, finally, we are also interested in Monero because Monero, uh, in Monero, egalitarianism is actually a very big argument for the system, and they are actually using a, a, a memory hard uh, hash function, which is uh, kryptonite. So our results have shown that, uh, well, as expected perhaps, uh, Bitcoin is the worst in terms of uh, egalitarianism. And it's followed by Ethereum, then by Monero, and then Litecoin. So let me now describe what uh, our methodology for, for finding this uh, egalitarianism for the proof of work coins. So first, what we did was we collected all mining uh, equipment that's available for purchasing online. So uh, we, we found all the machines and the specs for each machine that can be used to mine a specific uh, cryptocurrency. And then we uh, found the investment cost, so which means how much money would you, would you need to buy the machine? And also how much money would you need to pay uh, in electricity well, per hour based on the nominal uh, values of the, the machines as they are advertised on, uh, on the internet. So after that, what we do is we find the revenue. So we, uh, we calculate how much profit this machine can actually buy you uh, in terms of you know, crypto, new cryptocurrencies that you can mine. And then, uh, the income rate is just uh, you know the revenue minus the cost. Okay, so how do uh, how do we compute the uh, the revenue because the cost is you know, pretty easy? Well, this is the formula, and uh, let me explain it uh, very quickly. So well, the first value is just to translate uh, seconds to hours. Then we take the hash rate power of the machine. And we divide it over the, the total hash, uh, hash power of uh, the network. So, well, THR here are practically you know, uh, 
implies the difficulty of, uh, of the cryptocurrency. And then we multiply this by the, the amount of money that you're expected to get per hour. So this is uh, the block rewards per block, then the block production rate, and then uh, the, the price of uh, the cryptocurrency uh, denominated, denominated in uh, US dollars. And then from that, uh, from that value, which is like the pure uh, money that you can make of uh, this specific machine, we subtract the electricity costs, which are you know, the, the costs, uh, the energy consumption that uh, the machine has uh, per hour in watts, uh, multiplied by the, you know, the, the electricity cost of uh, well, um, the country that you're operating uh, in. And for our experiments, we actually considered uh, well, the, the average price of electricity in the US. Okay, and finally, we have uh, this, uh, this revenue for every machine. How do we decide which machines to buy? So the way we do it is, uh, well, we are, you just apply, in, our exper in these experiments, we just apply a dynamic programming solution in this uh, kind of knapsack, uh, knapsack problem. And um, this is pretty straightforward, so this is just a classic uh, dynamic uh, uh, programming that you would, uh, you would run. And uh, notice that the last, uh, the last term there is, uh, means that you actually buy all the machines at the beginning. So in our experiments, we don't assume that you can buy uh, with uh, uh, you can buy more machines with the money that you make of of the mining. Uh, so in this way, again, our experiments are only an approximation of the optimal strategy that you could follow. Uh, but we actually bypass this uh, this problem in a, in a more enhanced uh, simulation where we use uh, linear programming in order to actually take into account uh, reinvesting in. Uh, mining equipment, as well as electricity, as we do here. All right, so after we have uh, uh, found the allocation strategy, we can start mining. So practically, we find uh, which machines to buy, we buy them, we start mining as long, obviously, as they make profit. And uh, we actually reinvest part of these freshly mined uh, coins in order to pay for electricity costs uh, during the operation. And in the end of the year, we just uh, compute how much money uh, this whole operation has uh, produced in terms of newly created cryptocurrencies. Again. All right, so let's see the experiments. So this is, uh, these are the figures for Bitcoin and Ethereum. So in Bitcoin, uh, we, we, I have also added here the, how electricity costs actually affect uh, uh, the, the egalitarian curve. And it's kind of expected that the, the better the electricity cost is, so the lower it is, the more uh, returns you have. So this, uh, this kind of makes sense. But it's kind of interesting, the, 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 the slope and the, the, the way that the curve is, uh, is, is kind of interesting because we actually see that it, conver it slowly converges to this uh, single value. So after a, a, a point, after some amount of initial uh, funds, we actually, it will be approximately stable. And the reason that we see this is because the, uh, the best raw uh, returns that you can get is what the best machine can buy you, right? So if a single machine uh, costs, for example, $2,000, and it's the best machine that you can get in terms of uh, the, the revenue that I described before, then this is what you could buy. If you have $4,000, then you buy two of these machines because no other machine could actually give you more uh, money. Uh, and this is why we see these kinds of uh, peak, this, uh, this uh, upper uh, limit in the, the revenue. And the reason that we see these uh, SOTUs is because if you have, for example, $2,002 in the example that I said before, then you buy the machine with uh, the 2,000, but these two dollars are just, you know, you, can, you cannot buy a machine with these two dollars that is profitable. So these are, well, more or less discarded. They're thrown to the garbage. So if you, can, if you have uh, more money than you can actually use in order to pour them into your mining uh, operation, 
then this actually means that you get uh, less, uh, less returns. But also an interesting th see, thing to see here is that this curve follows this Sybil uh, strategy that I described before. So for every value of uh, in, uh, investment capital, the multiples of this value have at least as much uh, returns as you know, this point. And uh, we see that in Ethereum, it's, uh, it follows the same pattern, the curve, but with slight variations, which have to do with uh, the, the equipment that is available on, uh, on the market. Same, we ran them from Litecoin, we ran them from Monero. They are consistent, our experience are consistent across these currencies. Again, we see the same pattern with slight variations uh, depending on what the equipment is available. And also we run it on Decred. So Decred is the, the other cryptocurrency that existing cryptocurrency that we evaluated. And it's kind of an interesting case because it's actually a hybrid cryptocurrency. It uses both proof of work and proof of stake in order to create blocks. So we were uh, curious to see how this actually uh, works in terms of uh, egalitarianism. And again, as we see here, uh, uh, the, the proof of work part of Ethereum follows the rules that we have established for uh, the proof of work coins. But let's go to proof of stake now. So in proof of stake, uh, things are actually kind of simpler because the way that you participate in the, in the system is you get some coins and that's it. You just use them in order to uh, create new coins, to create blocks and via them new coins. So the minimum requirements, the requirements that you have to have in terms of initial funds is just enough, mo enough money to buy some machine with network access. So this is very low, obviously. Uh, and then uh, what we consider uh, for proof of stake is the proof of stake decrypt, where things are kind of complicated. It's not like the, the very straightforward uh, uh, proof of stake uh, system because there they use tickets. So in order to participate in the system, you have to use some specific amount of coins in order to buy tickets and using that ticket, you can actually enter the, the lottery in order to, to create new blocks. So this means that uh, uh, the, the way to participate in the system is kind of quantized because you can only buy uh, the, some specific uh, quantities of, uh, of tickets. So again, if for example, your ticket, uh, a ticket costs like $2 and you have $2.5, this 0.5 is useless to you. Uh, but on the other hand, if the ticket price go, goes down, then you know, uh, the, the, this, uh, the egalitarianism will actually go up because this, this quantum, uh, quantum the, this quanta will be smaller. So you, could, you, you will be able to use all your money practically to participate in the system. In pure proof of stake, things are much simpler because one dollar can actually buy you a specific amount of coins. And uh, uh, every dollar can actually buy you the specific amount of coins. You do you not know, get any discounts if you have more money. So uh, perhaps by, as you expect by now, pure proof of stake is almost perfectly egalitarianism, egalitarian in that way. So this is what we see for uh, proof of stake decred, which uh, is, again, follows the same pattern as proof of work, but as we will see, it's actually better. And in pure proof of stake, well, as long as you have enough money to buy uh, a laptop, then the, the, any extra dollar that you use to buy coins it will give you back the same percentage of uh, revenue. So finally, uh, I will, uh, we will use these curves in order to compute this specific metric, this crypto egalitarianism that I described at the beginning. And these are the results that we get. So again, this, uh, the egalitarianism here actually describes the variance of the, the graphs that we saw before. And as you might expect by now, as we said, Bitcoin is the worst. Well, actually decrypt proof of work is the worst, but uh, the reason that we, that we think this is the case is because of the mining equipment for decrypt is not as, uh, pluralistic as for Bitcoin. But a a apart from that, Bitcoin is the worst along with Ethereum and then Litecoin and Monero, which actually did make claims of egalitarian egalitarianism are better than these two coins. And finally, the, the proof of stake uh, systems that we looked into, Decred and the pure proof of stake are the best, uh, which is you know, compatible with uh, the figures that we saw. 
So in conclusion, what we did in this work was uh, we actually looked into this discussion about egalitarianism in cryptocurrencies, and we managed to create a concrete metric in order to have some base of comparison of the different systems. So this metric actually allowed us to compare various uh, existing currencies and see which is more fair or which is you know, less egalitarian or more egalitarian. And uh, what we saw is that in proof of work, proof of work in principle is worse, is less egalitarian, and uh, rather proof of stake is more egalitarian. And the reason is that, again, uh, in proof of work, you cannot do something better than the best machine that's available uh, on the market. And unless that machine costs well, one cent, then egalitarianism will be worse. Thank you very much. I want to ask that um, I would expect that in a both proof of work and proof of stake system, you would also take into account maybe like a network effect of the fact that if I have a lot of money, I can probably buy equipment cheaper. Probably I can also, I have to store the equipment somewhere, I have to pull the equipment. So actually, there should be, or I know it's very hard to estimate, but something that probably should be taken into account. And also, in the proof of stake, it's not probably also true that every dollar invested gives you the same return because you assume that people are using their own savings but actually in normal case I would see what is the return I would try to borrow certain capital and actually if I have more money I would probably be able to have better deals in terms of how much capital I can borrow in order to invest in order to have certain return and so on. Okay, let me uh, answer the first and then so for the first uh, question, that's true. I mean, uh, in principle, in uh, you know, economies of scale like that, you would expect to, if you have more money and if you buy more equipment, it would become cheaper. But that, has, that actually works well more in uh, favor of our results because you know, if you have more money and you buy equipment cheaper, then that means that you have more profit. So your percentage as a returns would would be would be more. So, but that's that's true. These are some kind of metrics that we assume static in our model. But we could, uh, in future work, take them into account, along with the other uh, metrics that I, that I assume that are static. So for the second question, I didn't quite understand why you would, uh, wh why this is not how it goes. But I mean, an, an answer that I can give is that I'm not sure if this is what we, you're asking. But here we actually consider the pure proof of stake as it is, uh, you know, theoretically, and not, uh, for example, delegate proof of stake. No, I meant that uh, in terms of. My return per year, right. in the sense, like a richer person has access to a cheaper loan. If I'm a poor person, I can... You mean loan to buy the cryptocurrency in the first place? No, because you presented basically the return of like 30%, right, per year in the graph. Uh, in the proof of stake graph? Yes. So, yes, here I assume, for, so in the pure proof of stake, what I say is, all right, do you have enough money to buy a laptop? Let's say you do. Then. Every other dollar that you have and you want to put it in the system, you can actually use it to buy the same amount of coins. Does it make sense? Because you, again, you assume that the price is uh, static, right? And for every coin, then you can actually participate in the system. And this coin buys you the same amount of power as every other coin in the system, regardless of who bought it. If it was you or Bill Gates, it will have the same power. Does it make sense? Okay. <laughs>